Well, good morning, Edgemar Alliance Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Very good. All right. Well, happy Palm Sunday to you. Can we give it up for our worship team there for leading us this morning? Amen. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 21 this morning. So if you wanted to turn there with your Bible or your phone, uh, you can do that. Um, we're going to be talking about Palm Sunday, why we call it Palm Sunday. This is the passage, the passage that's in there. And uh, while you're turning, I'll just give you a quick update. Uh, I got to hang out with Pastor Connor a little bit. Uh, we didn't talk church. We talked basketball, watching some March Madness. And uh, he's doing great on their sabbatical, but you can be praying for the Nigan Fine family, if uh, you're aware, they are uh, in the foster care system, so they have been fostering a young uh, boy the past few months, and they had a beautiful, hard weekend as uh, he was reunited with his mom, which again is, is a beautiful thing, but obviously uh, there's heartache that comes with it, so definitely be praying for them uh, in this time. But like I said, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21 this morning, uh, talking about the triumphal entry, Jesus entering into Jerusalem, and the cool part about uh, this uh, passage of scripture is that this story shows up in all four of the gospels. And so uh, it's a big deal if it shows up in, uh, in the Bible, but if it's in all four, you know it's a pretty big deal. And uh, the cool part about it as well is that each account gives something a little bit different that we can kind of focus in on and reflect on this morning. And so we're going to do that with me. But I need some, some class participation, okay? So I'm going to read Matthew 21 verses 1 to verse 11, but there's a spot, if you're looking at it in your Bible, in verse 9, where it says, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that follow shouted, and Matthew says there's like three lines that he gives that they shouted. So you got to pick one and then shout it when we get to that part. Does that sound good? All right, so your, your options are, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, or Hosanna in the highest heaven, right? If you want to shout, you'd be very biblically accurate. If you just want to say it, that's okay. If you don't want other people to hear you, I'd recommend saying one of the Hosannas because the blessed in the name is the long one, right? All right, we're good. So everybody got, you got one pick? You picked one? All right, here we go. All right, Matthew 21, verse one. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Let's just pause there real quick. This has nothing to do with the message, but if, if you do what the disciples did, Jesus is... Jesus instructs it, and you go and do it, you're going to be all right in life. Okay, here we go. Moving on. Verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, the crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted. That was awesome. All right. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So with that text this morning, we're going to be asking two questions. And the first question is, is just what we caught right there at the end. How does your life answer the question, who is this? This is Jesus. How do you fill in that blank? How do you fill in that blank this morning? Because as you see it in the story, I think it's, true in most of our lives, I'd say everyone's life, is when you come face to face and experience Jesus, there's a stirring that happens. There's an experience that happens and you're confronted with this question, who is this? This is Jesus and you fill it in, right? And I would say however you fill in that blank probably determines the trajectory of your life. And this isn't something that was uncommon to even the disciples. If you remember the story, there's a great story where the disciples are on a boat. Jesus is taking a nap, right? There's this great storm that happens on this boat. The disciples are like panicking. The, the boat sounds like it looks like it's going to capsize, right? They go wake Jesus up. Apparently, he's a heavy sleeper, right? And he comes out, and Jesus, just using his words, calms the storm. And what do the disciples say? They were amazed and shocked, and they say, who is this? that even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus actually asked them in a more pointed way as well. In Matthew 16, uh, 
the, the, he's having a conversation with his disciples on the road, which I, I like to picture they had a lot. Uh, and he says, hey, who do the crowds say that I am? Right? Like, what's the word on the street? What, you know, what, what are people saying? And his disciples threw out a few things. But then he levels it right at them. And he says, but who do you say that I am? That, that's the question we all have to wrestle with this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is? And it's a, a reflection, I think, that is appropriate for Palm Sunday. Who do you say that Jesus is? Uh, if you caught the crowd's answer when Jesus entered Jerusalem, they already missed it, okay? They said, who is this? They said, oh, he's the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, they got his location right. He, went, like, he did live in Nazareth. That's good. But a prophet is just somebody that shows up and speaks to people on behalf of God. Jesus is God. Come down from heaven to earth to not just deliver a message of hope, but to rescue, to redeem us, to restore us, to to enact his reign on planet earth. So the crowd missed it. But hopefully, if we are following Jesus, we'll know how we fill in that blank. And and there's a lot of good ways that I think you could fill in that blank. Uh, Many of us, you probably had a couple. I think I even heard a few people that shouted some out. Maybe Jesus is savior to you. Maybe he's your healer. Maybe he's, he's the sanctifier. He, he, he restores us. He is the alpha, the omega. He is equal in power and co-equal in majesty. All these things are true. If you read Matthew's gospel, he makes it very clear what he's trying to communicate here, and that's that Jesus is the king. That's how Matthew wants you not just to picture this scene. That, that's the lens in which Matthew wants you to read his entire account of Jesus. If if you check this out, Matthew, it, it, it's a cool, like if you want to have a fun little personal Bible study, just look and see how Matthew is trying to paint this picture of Jesus the King. He starts off the Bible, the, I'm sorry, not the Bible. He starts off his account of Jesus with, with it. He doesn't get more than a few words in, and he's already trying to get your mind to think that, because what does it say? This is the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Which David? Like, yeah, like David and Goliath, you remember that dude, right? Like, he was the king that Israel had that they all saw. Man, we haven't had, there hasn't been a king like him. When David was around, things were real good, right? We had, we had order, we had peace, we had, we had what we felt like was the, a little slice of heaven on earth, even though David had his, his missteps and his mistakes. That's what the Israelite people would have associated that with. And when you said David, oh, oh you mean that David, right? He goes on further. This is a really cool part. So the beginning of Matthew might seem a little dry, right? It's just like a genealogy, like this person fathered this person who fathered this person, right? You might be like, it's a weird game of 23 and me we're playing or something, right? But the cool part about it is if you look at it, everybody, it's just their name except for one person that gets a descriptor. And that's in verse six. It's, and Jesse fathered King David. Matthew is trying to already like beat a dead horse. He's like, he's trying to make sure you know this is what he's talking about. Look at it. In Matthew chapter two, we get the only account of Jesus' birth story where these magi from the east show up. And what's the first question they ask? Hey, where's the one who was born king of the Jews? Right, the the, the idea here that the, the picture is like, there's a king that's present, right? And Jesus, when he begins his ministry in Matthew says, hey, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. All of Matthew is, is, is about this idea that Jesus is the king coming to enact his kingdom. If you were with us, we just went through a series called Think Like Jesus, right? And the idea was, we looked at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which he said, hey, this is my kingdom, and here's how it works, all right? And you get it right in there, right? At the beginning of that, Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Matthew 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is is theirs. Matthew 5 through 7 is all about, hey, this is my kingdom. And if you're going to live in my kingdom, here, here are the, the edicts, here are the, here are the guidelines. If you want to build your life and have it last, no matter what storm comes your way, build it on this. Because if you build it on that, it's a sure thing. If you don't, it's going to crumble and there's going to be destruction. There's going to be collapse. This is what Matthew's gospel is communicating. And he, he, again, Matthew drives the point home here when he's talking about Jesus. Because when he enters into Jerusalem, not only is he trying to get you to think, oh, this is the king returning to the, to the holy city, he also makes sure that you know, no, 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 uh, we knew this was coming, right? He, it says if you caught it, like, 
to, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Which prophet? Right? This verse is from Zechariah. This is what he's quoting, right? Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Matthew says, he's quoting this scripture. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bro will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. And there are some people in the story that even shout, some of you shouted it, Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus is the king, and Matthew wants to make sure we know that. But my question to you this morning is just that, is Jesus your king this morning? Because I can tell you, in my life, I can, I can remember there was a, a, a time and point in my life where I believed that Jesus was Savior, but he wasn't the king. He, he wasn't the one calling the shots. I can remember uh, in high school, I, I went to two high schools. The second one I went to was just south of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, this little town called Harrisonville. Uh, we had the Walmart, not a Walmart, the Walmart, and a uh, real little town, about 8,000 people. And uh, because it was so little, anytime me and my friends wanted to go and do something, we had to basically drive north to where, you know, like civilization was. And, uh, and so we're, we're in the town, and, and again, don't judge me, okay, I'm just being honest with you this morning. In high school, I listened to a lot of rap music. I still listen to rap music. I still enjoy rap music. But in high school, my choice of rap music was not great, all right? Like the beats were fire, right? They were awesome, but the lyrics were total trash. They belittled women. They had uh, more expletives. That, I mean, it was, it, they, were, they were really, really bad lyrics. And so uh, I would be driving with my friends and my little, little two-door Dodge Neon, right? And we'd be going, listening to music, turning up loud, and we'd have to go north out of the town, but when I would drive north, I'd have to pass the church that my dad was a senior pastor at, okay? And so here's what I would do. As I would drive past it, I would turn the volume down and drive past the church, then make sure I didn't see it in the rear view, and then I'd turn it back up, right? Why? Because I believed that Jesus was Savior, but I, I didn't believe he was the king. It wasn't about the music, that, that picture is a microcosm of part of my struggle, which, which was, God, I want to believe you to save me and rescue me, but God, I'm, I'm fighting you on, on who gets to be the one in charge. And I would guess that it's a, a battle that many of us face. Are you willing to submit everything under the kingship of, of Jesus? To say, this kingdom, God, is yours, and I'm going to pour everything in my life to coming under your reign and your rule, because God, I, I don't want to play the game where I think just because I drove past a building, I'm turning this down, and, and in certain areas, I'll act this way. No, like, is everything in your life under that? So, so even if you would, just pray with me this morning. Father God, if there is a, a place in our life that we have not declared you king, we declare that over to us this morning, Jesus. God, that it all is yours, Lord, that we are your beloved children, but God, we are also under your rule and your reign this morning, Jesus, we fill in that blank by saying that you are the king. Amen. The second question I want to wrestle with a little bit this morning is this. Um, what kind of king are you looking for? And, and I think it, it lends well to the story because if we are addressing that Jesus is our king, what is the image, the picture of what kind of king Jesus is? Who, who is he to us? And not just that, but... Who is he? How, how does his rule, how does his authority go? Are, are, are we looking for a political king? Are we looking for a manipulative one who accrues power and gets the job done no matter what damage is there? Are we looking for a military conqueror who abolishes his enemies? Are we looking for uh, no king at all, like everyone's just their own king, right? Or, or are you looking for a king who's going to come and bring real peace and real restoration and authority to the grandest parts of the universe, but also into your own backyard. Matthew has, has kind of painted this picture for us, and, and I think uh, the visual of Jesus riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem, I think gives us, I'm gonna use a big word here, but, but it's because it's the only word for it. it. He gives us this great juxtaposition, okay? And again, I'm not trying to impress you with my like Scrabble knowledge, okay? Like the, the, the reason that's such a good word is because to juxtapose something means you take two or more things and you put them next to each other to demonstrate how different they are, okay? So like if Shaquille O'Neal came out, Shaq, come on out. 
I'm just, that would be cool though, right? No. So if Shaq came out on stage and you saw him next to me, it, it would be a big juxtaposition, okay? Like he is a very large man. I'm very small, right? Like he has broken, I think, 12 backboards by dunking the ball in his life. I've never been able to touch the rim on 10 feet, okay? So like the juxtaposition, that, that, and so Matthew is doing that here. And, and I think uh, the question is then, well, well who, who are we juxtaposing Jesus against? And, and there was a figure that he wasn't alive in Jesus' day and age. He lived about 300 years before him. But his sort of legend and this sort of fantasy person that was created around him was very prevalent in Jesus' day and age. And I would even argue in our day and age. And it was a guy by the name of Alexander the Great. And I, I inflected my voice there at the end on purpose because like, what, was he really great? Are we, are we sure about that? Like, what, was he great? There was this crazy kind of fantasy image. And, and so uh, when Jesus enters in, he's entering into a culture that has a very different picture of what it means to be the king or to be the man. All right, so, so again, th- 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 what I'm gonna describe is like this sort of false man, this sort of false king that the culture around at large in Jesus' day and age said, oh, this is what it means to be that person. And it was really started by this guy, Alexander, right? Which if you were gonna be great, meant you had to be elite, you had to be wealthy, you had to be privileged, and you had to be a male or willing to act like a male to get what you needed, right? You had to not only have wealth and power and status, but this false image of, of a man meant that with this, with this status and power and privilege and resources I have, I need to dominate all my opponents, right? I need to humiliate them in front of a crowd. I need to let everybody know, hey, I got the goods, you don't, and I'm clearly better than you, right? This, this false image of, of a man basically said like, hey, whatever sexual desire you want, like pursue it, no boundaries, like d- just go nuts, right? And, and, and I feel like I need to pause on that one for a second and, and hopefully you're starting to draw some lines to our culture. Like, uh, can we just collectively continue to push against like this seduction that like having multiple sexual partners is like the man, right? Th- th- let me quote this other, this is a, a good rap song, okay? That, that, uh, by this guy named Lecrae, here's his lyrics. He says this, any boy can go find a girl and try to satisfy her for a whole night but a real man can take one woman and satisfy her for a whole life. All right, that, that, that's, I, I, just, I just feel like we need to pause that to say like, don't, don't get trapped into this false idea. This is what Jesus is walking into. It's still very prevalent in our day and age. Like, like sexuality with no boundaries is not God's way, all right? And so uh, this is what Jesus walks into. The other crazy part, and I think the picture does it such justice, uh, Alexander had this like legendary war horse named Bucephalus, right? Like, I guess there's a statue of this horse in Scotland, right? It's like a whole thing, right? So, and, and this idea that like, like if you had this great horse that that made you a better king or a better man, and clearly we don't have anybody in our culture that's still trying to fight for status based on their horsepower, right? Uh, the other one was this, right? That if you're gonna be the man, you have to be this conquering military leader. That you have to, again, obliterate that through slaughtering your enemies, you can achieve this idea of what was in Jesus' day and age. It was called Pax Romana, which was their version of peace. But peace didn't mean there weren't any wars. Peace meant that you overpowered your enemies and you you oppressed them so much that they had zero ability to resist. It wasn't the absence of war and conflict. It was, we have so much power that we we can assert anything we want on you and you're just down in the muck, in the dirt. And this is the image that Matthew is trying to juxtapose Jesus against. But even there's another one, I think, too, because some of the, the, the Jewish people in Jesus' day and age, I think, and I would argue what they wanted, was they wanted like the, like the, the holy version of Alexander. You see what I'm saying? Like, well, like, throw a Bible in his hand and he'll be all right. You know what I mean? Like, they wanted like, oh, let, let's just kind of, you know, all right, we'll just bless that and, and whatever, however we get our way, we'll get our way as long as we're the ones in charge, and again, Jesus enters in, and, and how does Matthew describe him as a king? Read it with me. It's righteous and victorious, but what is it? He, he describes him as, your king comes to you gentle, lowly, riding on a donkey. And, and the cool part about this picture, I think that I, is cool, that I think is cool, like, Jesus might be the one riding on the donkey, but he's not the jackass in this picture, okay? Like, like it's the other guy. This is, this is 
the image that Jesus is coming against because when Jesus came, he came and he established peace as a king. What kind of peace? Ephesians 2 tells us that Jesus himself is our peace, that he broke down the dividing walls of hostility, that he preached peace to those who were far and peace to those who were near so that through him they could be united and be one body, united to the praise of God the Father, that we are joined together in him and we become a holy temple to the Lord. This is the peace that Jesus is ushering in. And how did he accomplish it? This is, this, I think, I think we need to lean into some of this tension a little more. How did Jesus accomplish this, this sort of conquering peace? Because he is a conqueror. But how did he accomplish it? Go with me here. This is in Revelation chapter 5. Now, uh, don't get freaked out by, by Revelation, okay? So, so Jesus' disciple John gets this picture, this vision of, of a, a, a true vision of, of sort of this, these end time sort of scenes, okay? And, and watch what happens here. I, I, think, I think this is really important to understand how Jesus conquers. So Revelation 5, 5 through 6, it says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four four living creatures and the elders. Again, you get this visual, and I think it's even a song we sang here a couple weeks ago, The Lion and the Lamb, that Jesus is the Lion of Judah that conquers. And in Revelation, they're saying, look, look, there's the Lion, but when you look, it's a Lamb that looks like it was slain. So when Jesus came, how did he conquer? Did he conquer in the typical Lion fashion where he ripped apart his prey and he tore everything to shreds? No, like, he conquered through sacrificially giving up his life. And, and in this sort of upside down way that Jesus, because of this in Philippians 2, it says, because he was obedient even to the point of death, God has exalted him. And he's given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because he came and he conquered, but not through this vicious might of a lion, but through the humble way of a servant, of, of of dying as the lamb on our behalf. That Jesus came and he conquered by dying for you and for me and for your enemies and for the people that drive us nuts. And and we were all actually, as Romans tells us, we were once enemies to God. And yet even in our enemy state, he still chose to love us. He still chose to rescue us, to save us, to redeem us. This is Jesus here. And, And the crazy part is this. Jesus gets this position, right? So God elevates him as he, as he dies, as he's slain for us. He, he allows him, not, not allow, he, he affirms him as the king over all of us. And what does Jesus do with that power? What does he do with his power? He leverages it in order to get us home. He leverages his power to make sure that we all could have a seat at the table in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus describes it to his own followers like this in Matthew 20. Jesus said to them, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. In my kingdom, it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, he leveraged his life, he leveraged his power. Again, in Philippians, it tells us he leveraged his privilege as God. He leveraged everything in his kingdom to reconcile us to God the Father. He did it all to, like I said, make sure we could come back home. And so the question I wanna ask you this morning is, when we reflect on shouting Hosanna, which means save us, who are you shouting or what are you shouting Hosanna to this morning? Because my friends, let's not be fooled to thinking that we can shout Hosanna to the White House or a political party. Let's not be fooled that we can shout Hosanna to winning the lottery. Let's not be fooled that we can shout Hosanna save us to a human relationship or Hosanna save us to this dream job. Don't look to those things that cannot rescue you, that cannot redeem you, that cannot be king over all to rescue us. We shout Hosanna this morning to the risen king to Jesus who came as the lion and conquered as 
the lamb who now sits on the throne. And we say, save us, Lord, in the midst of brokenness in the world, in the midst of pain, in the midst of the heaviness, we recognize that there is victory in Christ Jesus. He already is victorious. And that's where we land on this morning. And, and what I think is maybe a cool image that we can just kind of end our time on reflecting on is we call it Palm Sunday we, because when, when Jesus came in, people cut palm branches and laid them on the road. It doesn't tell you palm branches in Matthew's gospel. Apparently he didn't care for flora and fauna as much as the other ones, but other gospels say they were palm branches. And it's this idea that the call that Jesus has for us as followers of Jesus is to lay our life down. So just like we would be laid, just like the palms were laid on the road, how can you lay down your life like a palm so that the good news of Jesus the King has a road to travel on? How can we lay down whatever God has blessed us with? God, what what influence, what power, what privilege, what resources, what have you given me, God, that I can lay down and leverage so that the message of your kingdom can get to where it needs to get? God, how can we lay down our life to say, it's not about me, it's about the king. How can I lay down my life so the message of Jesus the king can get into my family, can get into my workplace, can get into my friend groups, can get into our county, our city. God, how can we lay ourselves down to say it's not about us building ourselves up, accruing things and making it seem like we can dominate everyone else, but how can we model your life, Jesus? Say, Lord, let us lay our lives down for you. God, we are willing to go to whatever it takes. If you're willing to admit that Jesus is the king, the call he asks us this morning is lay down your life. Lay down your life so the message of Jesus can travel. And then one day when Jesus returns, he'll pick us back up from the ground and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Pray with me this morning. Father God, we love you. Jesus, we cry out, Hosanna, save us to you, the king, Lord. We recognize we are in need of rescue that you are the one that has the power. And God, I ask that if there's anyone in here, Lord, that doesn't know you as as the king, that doesn't know you as the rescuer, the restorer, God, would they make that decision this morning? And Lord, for the rest of us that are your followers, God, we commit to laying down our lives, God, so that your message, that the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, can reach every area that we go into. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Be blessed, DAC. Thank you, guys.